Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Wednesday's lecture. Um, hopefully we finish up rotational motion today. Um, you'll notice that we only spent two, two lectures or four hours of lecture time on rotational motion, whereas we spent multiple weeks on translational motion. And the reason we're able to do that is because uh, we're, we've actually found a way to piggyback on our, an, our previous analysis of translational motion, and thus we do not have to reinvent the wheel for rotational motion. We merely just have to revisit our old story in the context of rotation, because a lot of the ideas are the same. Uh, before we jump into the lecture, I do want to give uh, some administrative reminders. So uh, the assignment four is obviously posted. It has been for a while now. Um, there's two components to assignment four. There is the online component as well as the handwritten component. Um, so yeah, please, please make sure you work on those. Um, uh, the test is coming up, I think, on June 13th, if I recall correctly. Um, let me just verify that by looking at the schedule here. Yep, June 13th. So that's not this Saturday. That is the following Saturday. And the timing seemed to work out, you know, just like it, uh, it seemed to work out fine last time. So we're going to try for 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. again this time as well. And uh, as with the previous term test, anyone west of, of Ontario will be accommodated. They'll have a shift and start time. But I believe everybody east of Toronto, um, although it may not be a perfect time, I think it's a reasonable time to host the midterm. So, um, okay, uh, in terms of specific chapter contents, I will be posting uh, some more information about it later, but informally, I'll tell you guys now if you are watching and or live at the moment, um, everything up to and including today's lecture video will be included on the midterm. Um, this is to allow sufficient time for students to review the content. Um, it would be unfair to teach something you know, let's say on June 10th, and then expect you guys to know it intimately enough to, to perform it on the midterm. So um, it's, it's up to and including today's lecture, and that is to ensure you guys have enough time to practice and reach out for extra help if you need it, and to ensure you've all had a tutorial uh, on that material as well. Um, okay. So I don't believe there are any other administrative announcements. Oh, I, I have some moderately good news. Um, it's, I don't know if it's an announcement per se. Um, it looks as though the Department of Chemical and Physical Sciences is going to be able to have access to Crowdmark very soon. Um, if you've ever taken a, a math class either on the St. George campus or on Mississauga campus, you might be familiar with Crowdmark. Um, it is a much smoother platform for um, electronic tests, and uh, it would actually make everyone's life easier, uh, yours as well as the, the teaching team, if we are able to use Crowdmark, because it, it, it allows for easier facilitating of submitting and, uh, and marking much smoother than Canvas. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping this comes through in time, that we can use it in time for, for term test two. Uh, if it doesn't, we're going to have to use Canvas again, which is everybody's burden, not just yours, but everybody's burden. Um, whichever one we use, if we use Canvas again, I'm going to try to remind students very strongly of the expectations. Um, you know, the due date is firm. Uh, students are allocated an appropriate amount of time to submit their solutions. They're, you're allocated 20 to 25 minutes to at, at the end to stop writing and use that time to upload your solutions. This means that you have 25 minutes to identify any technical issues and reach out to myself to help solve them. Uh, any emails that come through after the due date uh, for technical issues uh, pretty much means you didn't use those 25 minutes to upload. You use those 25 minutes to continue working and that's your prerogative, but you have to eat whatever consequences arise from that. So uh, I, I think 20 or 25 minutes is an appropriate length of time for you to identify any technical issues and reach out. Um, so as long as you reach out to me before the due date, um, then that, that's something we can work with. But reaching out to me after the due date is, is certainly not acceptable. And that expectation has been made crystal clear multiple times throughout 
uh, throughout this term. Um, okay, there, are, there will be more details about uh, the test made in an announcement in the coming days. Um, okay, without further ado, um, I think we can get back to the, um, the lesson. So uh, I think, I think here, yeah, I think you're still able to see the course notes, even though I was kind of changing my, uh, my screen here. So today we've, we've moved on from rotational uh, kinematics into rotational dynamics, and we call this torque. So just a bit of a recap, we are revisiting all of the four major units from translational motion. We're revisiting uh, kinematics, dynamics, energy, and momentum. So yesterday we did, um, uh, yesterday we did what kinematics, and today we're gonna do dynamics and energy. And then on Monday, we're gonna wrap up and do momentum. But uh, because we're doing momentum on Monday, it will not be part of the midterm. Okay, so uh, torque. What is torque? First, let's kind of think about the motivation of you know, where this idea comes about before we kind of launch into it. So um, this type of logic, I, I like to, I, I don't know if there's a formal name for this kind of logic, but I like to call this kind of logic proof, proof by the fact that it exists. Um, you know, I, I like to acknowledge that I don't necessarily know everything in the world, but other people know more than me. So, you know, I always think about, you know, why was something designed the way it was? Although I didn't design it, someone somewhere must know something more than I did. So, you know, uh, for instance, why is a doorknob located as far away as possible from the door hinge? And I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I mean, from young, from young kids, we've just been shown what a door is and we just use it, right? I don't know if anyone's really taken the time to pause and think about why a door was designed the way it was. Um, maybe that's just a physics brain, I don't know. But anyway, let's, let's consider that now. I'm bringing it to your, the forefront of your attention. Why is the doorknob on a door as far away as possible from the door hinge. Is that a coincidence? Well, it's unlikely it's a coincidence because doors around the world, uh, you know, whether it be in Asia or in, in North, uh, North America or in Europe, everywhere around the world, um, the doorknobs are as far away from possible as the door hinge. So it's, it's unlikely that this is just a fluke. So this is what I like to say, proof by the fact that it exists. There seems to be a reason behind this. What could that reason possibly be? And it doesn't take much thought to realize that if you put the doorknob uh, in the middle of the door, for instance, and you go to try to open the door while pushing from the middle of the door, it feels harder. And you don't even have to believe me, just do it. Right? The beautiful part about physics is you can just do it. Go to, after this lecture is done or whatever, you know, go to any door, your bedroom door, your front door, what have you, and try to open the door by pushing at the middle of the door and then do the same thing but then push where the doorknob is. You'll feel that it's much easier to open that heavy door when you push near the doorknob compared to when you push halfway in. So there's clearly something going on here. And um, that's really what we're trying to explain with torque. Now, the reason why it's rotational dynamics is because forces are involved. Here I am talking about pushing on a door. Pushing is a force, but it's not a translational force. You're not pushing so hard that the door flies off the hinges and, and moves forward, right? Your, your force has resulted in a rotating door, which is a type of motion, but it's not translational motion. So that leads me to the definition of torque. Now, I know we haven't looked at any math yet, but the definition of torque um, and this is the way I've defined it. This, you will not find this definition in any textbook. You will not find this definition online. The way I've defined torque is the, quali uh, the quantitative. Quantitative means the value, the quantitative measure of the tendency of a force to cause rotational motion. You can push a really, really hard on an object and the object will just go straight. So that is not causing rotational motion. That's causing translational motion. So torque is a value that is assigned to a force that indicates how much that force wants to cause rotation. Not every force will want to cause rotation. So let's look. The mathematical expression for torque 
And uh, as I'm looking at my lecture slides, I'm realizing I rushed typing them and there's a bit of a typo here. I said torque is actually F cross R. That's actually wrong. Torque is actually the vector R cross the vector S. That was my typo. Now, that only matters if we're in a calculus-based physics course. In an algebraic-based physics course like, our, like the one we're in, um, that typo won't affect you. Um, what does that mean, F cross R? Well, we know, let me just change my color here. We know from basic vector algebra, let's say grade 12, that there's two ways to combine uh, vectors. There's the dot product and the cross product. Now, we learned earlier in this class that if we had two vectors that were at an angle with one another, we learned that the dot product, f dot d, was the work done. And the way that this was described was it is the parallel component, f parallel. It was the parallel component of the force in the direction of the displacement. So the way we, in which we drew this or simplified this expression was f d cos theta. That's the dot product. The cross product, however, is the perpendicular component of the force in the direction of the uh, displacement or in the direction of the, the lever arm. We'll talk about lever arm in a second. So this, the torque, can actually be expressed as F times the lever arm, or if you want to use, if you want to use D, you can use D as well if you'd like, uh, force times the lever arm times sine theta, because this is the opposite side. So using your trig ratios, that would be sine theta. So that's what you're thinking about. Torque is the product, the multiplication of the perpendicular component of the force multiplied by the direction or the, the, the length of the lever arm. So that's what it is mathematically. Now, cross product, you might remember from grade 12 calculus and vectors, the cross product actually results in a vector, whereas the dot product results in a scalar. So torque is actually a vector. So we know mathematically the magnitude of torque. It's the perpendicular component of force multiplied by the lever arm. And as I mentioned before, we will talk about what lever arms are shortly. Before we do that though, let's see if we can nail down how to think about the, the uh, direction of this vector. So as we mentioned before uh, with rotational kinematics, we have uh, there, there's a way to think of these vectors in terms of our right hand. So, um, for instance, in this picture here, we have a, a picture of a bicycle wheel. If we apply a force to this bicycle wheel into the page, as depicted in this picture here, then the way you compute the direction of torque is using your right hand. You can uh, point your fingernails in the direction of the force and then curl them along the axis of rotation. And you see here the thumb, the thumb will point in the direction of the torque. So here I would say, if you take a bicycle wheel and you hold it in this exact orientation and you apply a force into the page at the top of the wheel, then the resulting rotation that the wheel obtains would mean that the torque is to the, to the left, right? So this is to the left. Now, in the same diagram, we have the wheel in the same orientation. Instead of pushing the wheel with the force into the page, if we pull the wheel with the force out of the page, then the torque would be to the right. Okay, now that's using one right-hand rule. There's another way to think about it, and uh, this is often colloquially referred to as the physics gangster sign. Um, if you hold your right hand up in this configuration shown, 
Um, I don't know if you can see my image. I might be really small in the corner of your screen at the moment, but I'm trying to mimic the image with my hand. If you hold your hand up in the exact way um, that is shown in the, in the picture here, you can, you can see the mathematical relationship between the cross product. So here, your thumb represents C, so this would be the torque, and A would be the, uh, the lever arm, and B would be the force. So if you wanted a way to sort of uh, use this other right hand rule to analyze this picture, let me erase all my notations here. My lever arm is the, the distance that connects the pivot point to the location of where the force is being applied. So um, here, my, uh, my, A, my, my index finger would be pointing up. This is my bad attempt at drawing an index finger. And my uh, force vector is my vector B. So my force vector is pointing in the direction into the page. And if you use your right hand and you draw your um, index finger up and your, and your uh, middle finger into the page, your thumb, oh boy, I don't know how to draw a hand. Your thumb will point uh, to the left. And I, I, I can't draw to save my life on a chalkboard, let alone on a tablet. But if you take your right hand at the moment and you point your index finger straight up in the air and you point your middle finger uh, toward the computer screen, you will see that your thumb points directly to the left. So that's what's going on there. And uh, similarly, uh, if you want to analyze the, the other wheel at the bottom here, uh, your, your lever arm is still pointed radially upwards and your force is pointed out of the page. So you take your index finger and again, you point it straight up and then your middle finger has to be uh, pointed directly at you out of the page, so out of the computer screen. And then your thumb is gonna be pointed to the right. So there's sort of two right-hand rules there that you can, that you can use. Okay, so um, let's talk about some situations that uh, where, where forces will cause torque and where the same force will not cause torque. So for instance, pushing a door at the, at the proper location of the handle will cause torque, right? You, you rotate the door above the hinge and it opens the door. If I take the same amount of force the same magnitude of F. If I take the same magnitude of force and I change the location of where I apply the force, and now instead I push at the door hinge for some crazy reason. I don't know why I would ever do this, but let's say you, you push with the same amount of force at the door hinge. That door is not going to rotate. So torque is the um, uh, a value, a numerical value that indicates how much the force wants to cause rotation. A force being applied at the hinge does not want to cause rotation. Thus, the value of torque will be low, or in this case, zero. However, applying the exact same magnitude of force at the handle does want to cause rotation does want to cause rotation. So the value of the corresponding torque will be large. So the same magnitude of force can easily cause different amounts of torque. It's, it's a function of the location or the function of where you apply the force that will govern how much rotation results. Um, the rest of them, I guess, are, um, I don't know, inconsequential. You can read them if you want. So here's an example. Um, a wrench is something that's used in, in everyday life, well, mostly everyday life. Um, most tools, actually, quite frankly, are, are designed based on physical principles. So anyway, let's just analyze the physics of a, of a wrench for a second. So here, we let's say um, someone's trying to use a wrench to to loosen the nut. 
if they apply a force to the wrench, and I mean, intuitively, if you're using a wrench, you're, you're, you're applying a force perpendicular to the shaft. Intuitively, your brain knows to do this, but bear with me. Let, let's pretend you're new to wrenches, which seems kind of odd, but let's pretend you're new to wrenches. And you apply a force, not perpendicular, because we're new and we don't know any better. Let's say we apply a force directly horizontally. I don't know, maybe, maybe the, the constraint of the setup only allows us to push horizontally. Maybe, maybe this nut is uh, wedged in a tight spot and we don't have the ability to push perpendicular. I don't know, let's just go with it. So if I push with a, a force of 17 Newtons, F equals 17 Newtons, at an angle, 37 degrees, then we can calculate how much torque we can apply on the nut. And the way we do that is, we look for the perpendicular component of the force compared to the lever arm, or the lever arm being the, the, dis, the perpendicular distance between the pivot point and the location the force is uh, located. So here we see, here's the pivot point, here's where the force is being located. So the lever arm, script L, the lever arm is given by the length of the wrench. In this case, in the problem, the length of the wrench is 25 centimeters. So we have force F, lever arm, and we look at the geometry in the problem. This is where like you would draw a free body diagram, for instance. We need the perpendicular component. So we break down our force into components. We have a component of the force that is parallel, and we have a component of the force that's perpendicular. We want the perpendicular component. This is the opposite over hypotenuse. So that's where the sine 37 comes in. So the torque on the nut would be 17 times 0 0.25 times sine of 37. So that's, that's how much torque uh, you would get on the nut. Now, for those of you who have used tools before, specifically ones to tighten or untighten something, um, your brain or everyone's brain seems to intuitively know that the longer the wrench, the better or the easier it is to use to both tighten and, and untighten something. The reason that is the case is because the longer the wrench, the longer the lever arm. We know torque is RF sine theta. Well, that's hard to see for you guys in green. Let me change colors momentarily. Torque is RF sine theta. So if you, if you increase the lever arm or if you increase the length of this wrench uh, with the exact same amount of force as you would have applied prior, you would increase the torque. So you can actually get more rotation out of the same amount of force if you have a lot larger lever arm. So that's why longer wrenches make it easier to tighten uh, and untighten certain things. Okay, um, let's just do a bit of a concept check here. I'm gonna launch the poll. Well, actually, can we even launch? No, this is, I can't launch the poll here. Um, this is not a multiple choice question. Okay, well, I'll just talk you through it then because it's not a multiple choice question. Um, we have a bar and the bar has a pivot point right here. Maybe the pivot point is say um, a bolt, you know, that it's allowed to spin around. I don't know. That's the pivot point. And we have five different forces that are being applied to this bolt, uh, to this, to this uh, rod. Which one, or they're asking you to rank the forces according to how much torque they produce. Every single force is exactly the same magnitude. The only difference is that the location of the forces are different. So here we have a force pulling down that is a distance of 20 centimeters away from the pivot point. So that torque would have, and, and we should also note that it's, it's a being applied at a right angle. So this torque, would simply be F times 20 centimeters, okay? 
the torque due to the second force? Well, you can see the second force is actually being applied at the pivot point. So this torque would be F and the lever arm for the force would be zero. The, the distance away from the force and the pivot point is the lever arm. The distance between the force and the pivot point is zero. So the lever arm is zero. So two actually uh, has no torque associated with it. Three, three uh, again is applied at a 90 degree angle and the distance away from the pivot point is 20. So this would be force times 20 centimeters for torque. So uh, one and three are tied at the moment. Torque four, hmm, interesting. Torque four is actually uh, being applied at the same location as torque th or as, as force three. However, it's at a different angle. It's no longer at 90 degrees, it's at a different angle. So the torque here would be F times 20 times sine theta. Now, I don't know what the theta is. Honestly, I don't, because it doesn't tell us in the picture. But I do know that sine theta is less than 1. Or let me, let me, draw, this, um, let me draw this in different colors. So I'm, I'm not saying the whole torque is less than 1. I'm saying that sine theta, I know, is less than 1. Because the maximum value of sine theta is 1. And that happens when sine of theta, when theta is equal to 90. Here, I can guarantee theta is less than 90, which means sine of theta is less than 1. So that makes this less than torque 3. I don't know how much less. It depends on the exact angle, but definitely less than torque 3. And then lastly, we have torque 5. Torque 5 is applied at a distance of 60 centimeters. So it seems like a large. Um, it seems like a large lever arm, so it would be force times 60 centimeters, but then it has to be multiplied by the sine of the angle between the force and the lever arm. So here, let's draw the lever arm. So the lever arm is the distance between the pivot point and, and the location where the force is being applied. So that is represented by my green vector here. And this is my lever arm. So what is the angle between force F5 and the, and the lever arm? What is the angle between those two vectors? And the angle here is zero. They're parallel vectors. So the sine of zero is zero. So if I had to rank these, I would say my answer is that torque one and torque three are tied. And then it's going to be torque four. And then it's going to be torque two and torque five are tied for zero. OK. Now. I know rotation is new for a lot of you. Hopefully you did some homework last night for rotational kinematics problems. Um, because rotation is new to you and the whole idea of a pivot point and a lever arm is new, we're gonna do some conceptual examples. So uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy the story. Um, some of these stories are things you can relate to. Some of these stories are personal to myself. Um, but hopefully after these examples, um, you can you can better, better relate to what a pivot point is and what a lever arm is. OK, so here's some conceptual examples. I kid you not, if anyone is from the UTM campus, and I know we have a lot of non-UTM students at the moment because it's an online class, but if you're from the UTM campus, maybe you can sympathize with this. Some of the doors in the CCT building have this Oh, I, I don't even know whose unbrilliant idea it was to do this. Some of the doors in the CCT building have this sort of semicircular door handle. It is probably the stupidest design of door handle I have ever seen. 
And as a physicist, it really, really irks me so badly. Here's why. Let me explain the physics of it. When you open a door, the door handle is usually as far away from the pivot as possible because it maximizes the lever arm, obviously. So let's look at this. If you were to open the door, where would you grab the door handle? You would naturally grab the door handle right there at the sort of at the at the apex of the semicircle. All right. Now, if you were to pull from this location, what would the lever arm be? The lever arm would be the distance between the axis of rotation. So let me draw this in a different color. The lever arm would be the distance between the axis of rotation to where the force is being applied. That is what the lever arm would be. You're asking yourself, but Mark, I am, I, although I'm physically touching the, the door handle at the, at the apex of the semicircle, however, if I pull on the piece of metal there where the green dot is, isn't that force transmitted upwards? And isn't that force being transmitted here? Yes, I agree. But by the same logic, the force being applied there, all this glass is connected to one another. The force from these glass molecules are touching these glass molecules, 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 these glass molecules. These glass molecules. So by your logic, I could just say, well, that's like applying the force right directly at the pivot point itself, which is obviously wrong. I cannot stress this point enough. The, the specific geometry of the shape does not matter. And this point will become clear as we do more conceptual examples. But I want to introduce the concept now. The specific shape of the object does not matter. Yes, the door handle is connected to the glass farther away than where you pull from. That does not matter. The lever arm is the distance between where the axis of rotation is and where you apply the force. Period. End of story. So whoever designed these door handles clearly doesn't know physics because they are minimizing their lever arm, meaning the people who open these doors have to put more force in to get the door open. Every time I go to use the doors in CCT, I always grab the door right here, even though that's clearly not where the door handle is designed to be used. I do that because my lever arm then is longer. Oh, you can't, well, whatever. That lever arm is actually larger than the red lever arm, meaning I have to put in less of my own force in order to open the door, right? Honestly, the only reason why I'm a physicist is because I'm lazy. Um, I, I've learned physics to minimize what I have to do in my day-to-day -day life and make my life more efficient. That's honestly why I'm a physicist. Okay, anyway, moving on to another example. Okay. I remember maybe about 10, 15 years ago, um, there was a really big fad or trend. Um, there was like a, this type of Ikea chair that didn't have legs. Um, they, they don't seem to be very popular these days, but when I was a child, they, they seemed to really be popular. And this Ikea chair was sort of made by a bent piece of wood, a single piece of wood bent into like an S shape as shown here in the, in the picture. And the reason why it didn't have legs is because it was supported by, you know, the wood frame itself. And when you're sitting in it, you know, there was no support over, over under your bum. So, you know, you could kind of bounce up and down a little bit. And uh, the wood was flexible, so it, it bent with you and you can kind of bounce a little bit. These chairs don't, aren't very common anymore. Some of you may have seen these chairs or some of you may even have chairs like this at home. I don't know. Anyway, let's look at the physics of this. A well-designed chair like this is, is good. In fact, it's quite fun to sit in. So here, if you sit in the chair, you apply a force right here where your bum touches. You apply a force straight down 
on this chair. And the force that you apply on the chair is exactly equal to your force of gravity, mg. Okay, let's look at the torque that, that you sitting in the chair would cause. Let's, let's look at the torque due to the force of gravity of, of you sitting in the chair. Well, the pivot point is the distance between, the perpendicular distance between the pivot point and, the, and uh, the, the line of action of where the force is. So here, the dotted line is the, is the lever arm. You can see here that the angle is 90 degrees. So the torque due to the force of gravity is going to be the lever arm times the force of gravity. Now, will this cause the chair to rotate? Well, light person, heavy person, medium person, it doesn't matter. For any amount of force that I push down on this, on this chair here, it is properly supported by the ground and there will be a normal force pointing upwards to properly counteract the, the, the torque due to the, uh, due to the force of gravity. So this actually perfectly counteracts oops, the torque due to the force of gravity. So the net torque is zero, which means there'll be no rotation. However, I have a personal story <laughs> about something like this. Um, many, many, many years ago, uh, what is it, 2020 now? Um, this would have been over 10 years ago. I, yeah, this would have been over 10, maybe, maybe 12 years ago. Um, my old boss from my first job uh, renovated his kitchen and he was really proud of his renovations. And so he invited a bunch of his employees over that night, uh, just like a, a bit of a barbecue party, I think it was in the summer. And he was show, showcasing his new kitchen. And part of his new kitchen featured some fancy bar stools, these chic new artsy fartsy looking bar stools. And it wasn't this exact one in the picture here, but uh, it was close. It was something along those designs. And, uh, and he was, you know, oh, Mark, here, have a beer. Enjoy yourself. Here, sit in my new nice bar stool. I'm like, okay, fine, no problem. Thank you. So I, I sit in this bar stool, and the bar stool has a back, uh, which is weird because it's not a stool then. But anyway, it had a little bit of a back, not a full back, but like a half back. So I, I, I went to go lean back in the bar stool, and I literally fell backwards. So this is the same sort of design as the chair in the previous slide, but you'll notice here that if you lean back, then um, your gravity plus normal force on the back of the chair is actually no longer straight down. It's, it's directed sort of backwards in on an angle. So where's the, where's the connection to physics 136? Let me re reiterate how to think about a lever arm. Okay, what you do is you say, here is my vector. Now the length of that vector depends on the magnitude of the force. At the moment, I do not care about how long the vector is. If I draw this to scale, the vector might be short or the vector might be long, I don't care. Here is how you find the lever arm. What you do is, you extend the direction of the force. I call it the line of action. So you see my black dotted line here. I'm extending the line of action. So I'm going to label this line of action. You extend the line of action of the force. And then you connect the pivot point of the object to the line of action such that you connect it at a 90 degree angle. So that's what we see here. We see if we connect the pivot, now obviously if the chair was gonna tip, if, if the chair was gonna tip, it would obviously tip. Um, here, here's the base, it might be hard to see. Here's the base of the chair. Uh, it would obviously pivot at the base, right? At the, at, the rear, at the rear end there of the chair. So I connect the pivot point to the line of action such that they intersect at a 90 degree angle. That geometry, that distance I just drew is your lever arm. That's how you find it. 
and you can set up your geometry, your triangles, whatever you want to find, to find that distance using trigonometric relationships. But that's how you find your lever arm. Okay, now why, is, why did I flip? Let's go back to the story. You can see here that when I leaned back in the chair, that I no longer had a normal force from the ground to counteract my, my weight. If I lean backwards, uh, there is a non-zero torque. There is a non-zero force times lever arm, which means rotation. So, you know, here I am holding my, my newly opened beer at my boss's newly renovated kitchen house or house in his kitchen. And I leaned back and I, I literally fell straight backwards. And I mean, I, I wasn't hurt or anything, but my, I did spill the beer, which is obviously the, 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 I broke the cardinal rule of drinking beer is never spill the beer. But in my defense, I, I really didn't have a choice. Um, I, physics spoiled me. I, I, I didn't properly look at the physics of the bar stool before sitting on it. And also further to my defense, I think at that time I, I didn't really know physics like I do now. I wasn't really a physicist back then. So, I mean, you could even argue that events like this in my life, like me having spilled my beer, said I can't possibly waste more beer in my life, therefore I have to learn physics to ensure this never happens again. Bit of a joke, but not really. Anyway, um, here's another personal story of, of mine. Uh, when I was 18, I had appendicitis. Well, I found out I had appendicitis. I didn't know that at the time. I just knew I had really bad abdominal pain and it got worse when I ate. And had I been a doctor or had a doctor been in the family, I would have asked them and knew what that was a problem. But anyway, um, it wasn't until much later I actually went to the hospital. I, I realized now that that could have ended very badly. I was lucky to not have uh, died from, from appendicitis, but anyway. When I woke up after surgery, after having my appendix removed, I was obviously drugged up with a lot of, uh, you know, painkillers and the, the anesthesia was wearing off. So I was kind of like groggy, not really with it. Um, as soon as I woke up, the nurse noticed I woke up and rushed over with a hospital food tray. And on this hospital food tray, she had some, I think it was orange juice, maybe apple juice, some sort of juice. And when you're coming out of surgery, you're not allowed to eat solid foods until your, your digestive system kind of wakes up again. Um, so instead of a solid food, they have to give you something for your blood sugar. So they give you juice typically. I'm not a doctor, this is just what I'm told. Anyway, so they give you juice to keep your blood sugar up. So she put a, a, a cup of juice on the tray and then she also put um, a, 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 a pitcher of juice, Ooh, like a pitcher. Of, of juice. My orange juice is going to be red at the moment because I don't want to find orange. And then uh, I also had a cup. I also had a cup of orange juice here as well. And she said, okay, have the cup of orange juice and I'll leave the pitcher here uh, in case you're thirsty and you, you want more. And I said, okay, thank you, thank you. Now, by this point in time, uh, I, I was just, I think I was in grade 12 physics, um, 18, yeah, I would have been in grade 12. So I was just learning about torque and just for the first time. And uh, I was in my half drug state. I'm thinking, hey, this hospital food tray uh, seems like it's, it's floating in midair, right? The hospital bed is designed to go kind of, you know, here. And the bottom of the food tray goes underneath the hospital bed. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, torque... Torque means that this hospital food tray should be, should be well designed if the base of the tray, if the base of the tray is long, either the same length or longer than the top of the tray. So I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but I mean, drugs do weird things to your brain. Um, at the time, I, I moved, I moved the pitcher of orange juice to the edge of the tray because I wanted to see if the hospital food tray was properly designed. As it turns out, the hospital food tray was not properly designed. I don't know how, how off it was, but um, the mere fact that the hospital food tray tipped tells me 
that the base of the tray was actually shorter than the top of the tray. So here's why this is a problem. Let me just erase all my scribbles here. Here's why this is a problem. The pivot point would be here. Okay, if the hospital food tray were to tip, the pivot point would be right there. Now, if we apply a force downward, let me change my color here. If we apply a force downward from the orange juice, then if we wanted to know the torque from the orange juice, we would have to extend the line of action. So extend the line of action of that force and then connect, what color should I do? Maybe blue. And then connect the pivot point to the line of action such that they meet at a 90 degree angle. So there's my lever arm. So the mere fact that the hospital tray tipped over tells me that there was a non-zero lever arm, which means the base was actually smaller than the top. Now, back to the story. When this happened, uh, being 18, of course, I, I obviously didn't go into surgery alone. Uh, my parents were there. And it just so happens that my dad is also a physics teacher. Um, and he was there with me when I woke up. And uh, he knew exactly what was going on. Even in my half drug state, he saw me move the pitcher of orange juice over to the edge. And then he saw the hospital tray like tip over and the nurse came running over. Oh my God, is everything okay? Like you just kick, you, here's a patient waking up at a surgery and there's a big crash. Like obviously we're gonna check if you're okay. And my dad immediately knew what was happening. And uh, he's like, he told the nurse, he's like, yeah, this hospital food tray is not designed properly. There's no way it should have tipped over. Um, <laughs> it was just funny. Like, uh, you know, I was drugged up, not communicating what I was doing to my dad. He knew exactly what I was doing because he also knew physics. And, uh, you know, he just calmly said, yeah, this hospital food tray is garbage. Like it, it's not balanced properly. The, the bottom is too short. It's not safe. He knew exactly what was going on. I thought the whole thing was hilarious. Uh, anyway, um, I have a follow up to that. Um, last year, uh, one of my parents had to go into a hospital, the same hospital, actually, exactly the same hospital, um, for a, a routine procedure. It, it was nothing, luckily, it was nothing major. And uh, while I was in the waiting room, uh, I, I noticed that the hospital food trays there uh, were new looking. Same hospital, same hospital as how I had my surgery. And uh, they were new. So I was looking at this and uh, I probably looked like a weirdo. You know, here I am in a hospital, like walking up to a hospital food tray, looking at it, you know, quizzically. Um, however, trust me, I, I, I made specific note of this. It looks like the new hospital food trays, the base is longer, yay, than the, oops, that's a terrible one, than the top. So this is a properly designed hospital food tray is when the base is longer. Cause in that way, when you were, if you were to put something heavy here um, and you have the force of gravity pulling down, then when you extend the line of action, the line of action lines up um, inside and the pivot point would be over here. So uh, what you're doing is effectively is you're just pushing the tray into the ground. You're not rotating the tray you're just pushing it into the ground as if, you know, you are leaning on a table, you know, you're increasing the normal force on the table. So um, that's a properly designed hospital tray. So redemption, I, uh, I've taught this class four or five times now, and I was only really able to save the redemption story as of last year, because April 2019 was actually a few months before um, June 2019. So this is actually the second time I'm able to say the redemption story. Okay, anyway. Hopefully those examples kind of better illustrate um, uh, what a lever arm is. Let's kind of move back into the math and the actual uh, physics. So we can actually relate everything we learned before in dynamics to, um, to this, th these new ideas. So we knew Newton's second law from before was F net equals MA. And we learned from rotational dynamics that uh, pretty much, sorry, rotational kinematics, that pretty much all we have to do is take all of our old equations 
and replace the, the, the translational or the linear variables with the rotational equivalent symbols. So f net equals ma, all we have to swap out f for torque, a for alpha, and, and m. What is m? So here we see, we know that linear f correlates to a uh, rotational equivalent for torque. We know a linear acceleration correlates to a, a uh, rotational equivalent alpha. However, m, m is interesting. And every single year, students kind of struggle with this concept. Mass, measured in kilograms, is a value, a numeric value, that depicts or explains an object's ability to resist, uh, uh, to resist changes in translational motion. What does that mean? If I push 10 newtons of force uh, onto a car, that car probably won't move very far because it has a large mass. If I push 10 newtons of force onto an apple, that apple will move far because an apple weighs much less. Mass is the number by which we quantify how much translational inertia the object has, how much ability the object has to resist changes of, of translational motion. Does that quantity in kilograms also reflect an object's ability to resist changes in rotation? The answer is no. You can have a very heavy object that's hard to push forward, but easy to get rotating. You can have a very light object that's easy to push forward, but hard to get rotating. For instance, picture a very long piece of wood from the hardware store. Most people are able to lift a piece of wood single-handedly with one person. It's not very heavy maybe about 10 pounds. However, that long piece of wood, if you were to try to carry that wood out of the store and turn a corner, you'll realize that when you go to try to turn the piece of wood, it feels heavy all of a sudden. And that's because you're trying to rotate the wood. So even though the mass of the wood is quite light, that specific object is, is hard to get rotating. So we actually have this new notion. It's the rotational equivalent of mass. We call it the rotational inertia, or I. Sometimes it's called the mo moment of inertia. We will come back to this a little bit later. But anyway, I want, I want you to realize that mass is for translational motion, and it does not accurately reflect um, an object's ability to resist changes in rotational motion. Okay, where does that leave us? F net equals ma, well that just becomes tau net equals i alpha because tau is related to f, i is related to m, and alpha is related to a. So there's no new formula here. F net equals ma, tau net equals i alpha, same equation. Okay, uh, here is an example. So let's quickly go through this math just so you can kind of see it working in action. So the tire of a car, so the, the tires of a 1500 kilogram car uh, are known to be uh, 60 centimeters in diameter. And the coefficient of friction between the road and the, surf, uh, the, road and the tire is 0 0.8. Assuming that the weight is evenly distributed, on all four tires, which we know it's not because the engine is on the front, so there's more weight in the front, but let's pretend that's not true. Calculate the maximum torque that can be exerted by the engine while driving before the tires skid or spin. So um, hopefully you've never done this with your own car because it's bad for the tires, but if you accelerate too quickly, your tires spin. And in the winter time, at least in Canada, when the, when the roads are kind of snowy and icy, um, the coefficient of friction is lower, and uh, you, you're, when you accelerate from rest, your tires will often spin. This is because your engine is providing too much torque to the tires and it overcomes static friction. So the question is saying here, how much torque can the engine provide to the tire before the tire uh, starts spinning? 
breaking static friction. So we start with a free body diagram. So here is the, the, um, the point of contact, if you will. So if the tire is rotating forward, then we know there's a force of friction. We know this from the previous unit. There's a force of friction forward, uh, pulling the car forward. Uh, however, the axis of rotation is the center of the wheel, obviously. So uh, we say the torque on the wheel due to the force of friction is gonna be the force of friction times the lever arm. Okay, so let's, uh, let's draw our lever arm. Here's the axis of rotation. Here's the line of action of the force. Let's connect the axis of rotation to the line of action of the force. Here we go, such that they intersect at a 90 degree angle. You can see in this case here that this distance is simply the radius of the tire. So this is gonna be force of friction times the radius, or I'm gonna say the diameter over two of the tire. Now, what is the force of friction? The force of friction is mu Fn times the diameter of the tire over two. And what is the normal force? Well, we're told that the weight of the car is approximately evenly distributed along all four tires. So what we're gonna get here is mu times mg over four, because there's four tires in the car. So the normal force on one of the tires is one quarter of the total weight times the diameter over two. Ergo, the torque uh, from the force of friction is mu mg diameter over eight. So we can plug in all of our values if you want 0 0.8, um, the weight of the car of 1500 times 9.8. What's the diameter? 0 0.6 all over eight. And that's how many, uh, that's how much torque you're able to uh, apply to the wheel from the engine before it overcomes static friction. Now, if I had to ballpark this, let's see here, um, eight and 0.8 would be 0 0.1 times 1500, oops, 1500, not 15,000, times let's say 10 and 60%. So let's see, if, without a calculator, this would be uh, 150 times 10, oh, I guess these two would cancel. So it would be about 60% of 150. So it would be about six times 150, which would be 600 plus 300 equals 900. And what's the units of torque? Well, um, simply a Newton meter. Because if you recall the formula for torque, it's force times distance or force times lever arm. So that's gonna be a Newton times a meter. So the unit for torque is a Newton meter. Okay, um, another example, the torque of muscles on your body. So a lot of you are pre-med and uh, this is why I, I put this example in here because it's probably relevant for a lot of you. So um, I'm, no, uh, I'm no biology expert uh, or, or an anatomy expert, but from my understanding, basic understanding of the human body, um, well, and physics for that matter. Um, mu well, muscles cannot push, we know this. Muscles can only contract and pull. So the mere fact that you're able to raise your arm, basic physics tells me that the muscle that uh, is attached to my forearm can't possibly be attached at my elbow. Because if it was attached at my elbow, uh, when my muscle contracts, it would be pulling on the pivot point, which would result in no torque. So um, if the mere fact that I'm able to open my uh, open and close my forearm tells me that my bicep muscle, wherever it attaches, it has to attach kind of on my forearm somewhere, not at the actual elbow itself. So according to this question, I'm trusting that whoever designed the question knows what they're talking about. 
apparently they're claiming that the muscle attaches about five centimeters into your forearm. Now, what kind of torque do we get as a result of this? Well, if your forearm is currently being held at a 90 degree angle, which who walks around like that? That's just ridiculous. But anyway, um, if your forearm is being held at a 90 degree angle, then the torque from the muscle is quite easy to calculate. It's just 700 Newtons times five centimeters. So 5% of, of 700, which is about 35 Newton meters of torque. Um, also, if you're wondering how we did that without a calculator so fast, 10% of 700 is 70, 5% is half of, of 10%, so half of 70 is 35. Anyway, moving on. Um, if you don't have your arm at, uh, oh, is this, sorry, this is a better example here. If you don't have your arm at a 90 degree angle, then the 700 Newtons of force is still being applied at five centimeters away, but now that angle is not being applied at 90 degrees. If your arm is sort of below the horizontal at 30 degrees, then you need to find what that lever arm would be. So in this case, uh, we need to use some geometry. We know this is five centimeters here, and we know this angle is 30, so we can say that the lever arm is actually going to be um, five centimeters times cos of 30, right? Because the lever arm is the blue. And what I'm doing is I'm extending the line of action. You can see the red dotted line. I'm extending the line of action of the force. And I am connecting the pivot point, which is my elbow, to the line of action such that they intersect at a 90 degree angle. That is how you find your lever arm. And using the geometry on the diagram, I do not use sine 30. If I use sine 30, that would be the parallel distance. That's not what I want. I want the perpendicular distance. So please draw a picture, because sometimes it's not sine. Sometimes you have to use cos. So the torque here would simply be 700 times uh, 0 0.05 times cos of 30. Okay. Okay. So back to uh, moment of inertia. We need to kind of hammer this out before we go forward. So as I mentioned before, um, moment of inertia is the rotation equivalent of kilograms or, or rotational equivalent of m mass. As mentioned before, mass is the numerical quantity that represents how easily an object uh, is, uh, can, is, is subject to change due to tangential acceleration. However, we are now talking about angular acceleration or rotational acceleration alpha. So that is given by I, the moment of inertia. Here's an easy example you can do. If you have um, a stick, or uh, weights at home or something like that, try doing this. Try taking a rod and putting some weight near the center of the stick on either end. So if you had a meter stick, for instance, halfway is 50 centimeters. Let's say you move the masses close to 50 centimeters. Grab the stick in the middle and then try to wiggle the stick like this, like the guy here in the image. Try to wiggle the stick. It'll seem fairly easy to do take the same mass and then move the mass toward the ends of the stick. Grab the stick in the middle and then try to rotate it. You will notice that even though the object has the same overall mass, I don't know why the pen is being weird here, even though the objects have the same overall mass, one is easier to rotate than the other. So difficult rotation, easy rotation, which means the moment of inertia of the first one does not equal the moment of inertia of the second one. So this is conceptually how you think of I, the variable I, the moment of inertia. Let's see if we can develop some intuition here. If you have an object 
that is far away or some distance r away, we know, we can even tell, we can convince ourselves this is true by literally just doing it. This is what I love about physics. You don't even have to trust me here. Just do it yourself and convince yourself. R1 is, is twice as large as R3. You can see that if you have something that's twice as far away from the pivot point, it'll be twice as hard to rotate. It's also proportional to mass. If you have something that's heavier, of course it'll be harder to rotate. So we've got two different relationships here. We know that the, the, the torque required to get something rotating is a function of radius. The farther away it is, the harder it is to rotate. We also know it's gonna be, uh, the torque required is also gonna be a function of M. The heavier it is, the harder it is gonna be to rotate. The question though is, what is the exact relationship? Is it just M times R? Is it, uh, you know, M divided by R? Is it M R squared? Is it R M squared? What's the exact relationship? And for this, we can actually use the, the relationships we, uh, we, we determined yesterday. So here, we start with the definition of torque. Torque is F times R. Now, if we wanna know um, the net torque, we can say, okay, well, F net, let me write in red, blue is kind of hard to see. F net is equal to MA, and the left-hand side still equals torque, obviously. Well, M, we don't know what M is yet. We're trying to figure out what the rotational equivalent of M is, but A, we know what A is. A is gonna be R alpha. So simplifying this a little bit, we get, um, uh, M alpha R squared and uh, alpha can be pulled out and we can group together the M and the R squared. Now, how do I know? I, I'm claiming here in my last step, I'm, I'm claiming that M R squared is equal to the moment of inertia. How am I able to make this claim? I could be wrong. Who, who's making up these rules? Well, recall that torque net equals I alpha. And we didn't know what I was. Our goal was to determine a formula for I. So I know the symbol I needs to exist. I just don't know the structure or the formula for I. So overall, oh, you can't see the blue. I keep forgetting. Overall, Uh, I know that my right hand side has to equal to I alpha. So when I equate the two, when I say I alpha equals M R squared alpha, you can easily see, oops, you can easily see that the moment of inertia I equals M R squared. So that allows us to come up with a formula. Now, you might not be totally satisfied with that derivation. I don't blame you. This is not a calculus-based physics course. So whenever possible, I like to sort of avoid the complicated calculus. Please understand that what I just derived is the moment of inertia for a point mass, meaning all of the mass of that object is located a distance r away from the pivot point then the moment of inertia will be m r squared. If the, mo uh, sorry, if the object is, uh, does not have all of the mass located in all in one spot, then you need calculus. Now, don't worry, we're not gonna expect you to do the calculus. We'll tell you what the moments of inertia are, but just so you understand, let's say for instance, um, we have an object where the mass is uniformly distributed, let's say in a circle. And let's say it's being rotated, like a, like a CD or a record, around the center here. In that case, all of the mass is not concentrated along the perimeter. It's concentrated, part of it's concentrated along the perimeter, yes, but part of it is also concentrated halfway, midway, three quarters, like it's uniform, right? So it's got a different moment of inertia. Now, you can have compound objects, objects that are comprised 
of, of many individual particles, such as this one here. If the whole system is rotating, you need to know what the overall moment of inertia is. And the overall moment of inertia is simply just the sum of the individual moments. So if you had an object or a system that had three rotating masses of different m's and different r's, you want to know the total moment of inertia, you simply add mr squared, mr squared, mr squared for each of the separate masses. Now, for those of you who have taken calculus, you know that it's a very, very easy leap to go from a sigma into an integral. So for those of you who are interested in the real definition and the mathematical definition of moment of inertia, it's actually defined as an integral. It is the integral of r squared, r squared meaning the distance between the pivot point and the location of that atom, dm. dm meaning you are integrating over all of the particles, all of the atoms in your object. So it is a calculus integral, but in this class, if you are needing that, we will give it to you. You are not required to perform any integrals. So here's some examples. If you have a solid hoop that is being rotated, then the moment of inertia is simply mr squared because all of the mass is concentrated along the perimeter. So each individual mass, if you want to think of this as a system of particles, each individual one will have m i r squared. So when you add them all up, when you add them all up according to this sigma here, all the masses will be the same, all the r values will be the same, so it's just simply mass total times r, so m r squared. Other examples include something like a solid cylinder. If you have a solid cylinder that's rotating, then the average location of the mass is, is halfway. So we say that the moment of inertia is one half mr squared. Again, you can prove this using calculus, but you wouldn't need to because we'll just give you the formula. Um, as I mentioned before, it matters how the object is being rotated. You'll notice here that you have a solid cylinder being uh, rotated along its own, its own axis of symmetry, which is fairly easy to do because a lot of the mass, in fact, the, the largest distance the mass takes is simply just the radius of the cylinder. If for some stupid reason you wanted to rotate this, this object around um, this center, so it rotates like this, then most of the mass is actually farther away from the pivot point than simply the radius of the, of the object. So here, it's, uh, it's more complicated of a formula. And again, it's obtained using a theorem that, well, actually, I will show you the theorem later on very shortly, but it's obtained using something called the parallel axis theorem. And uh, you, know, you, can, you can get the, the moment of inertia of an object being rotated about different axes. Uh, here you know, we've got a sphere. Uh, here we have a hollow sphere. Um, here we have a hoop again, but the hoop is being rotated uh, in this fashion, um, differently than obviously the, the hoop that we had previously. And uh, another example is where we have like a rectangular slab being rotated as well. So please understand that Mass is mass only when we're talking about translational motion. When we're talking about rotational motion, it matters how the object is being rotated and it matters the shape of the object. So there's, there's a lot of new ideas going on here. Here's parallel axis theorem. This is what I was talking about before. Parallel axis theorem says, if you are rotating the object around its own center of mass and you are now rotating the object around a different location, then you could obtain using cheating methods without using calculus from scratch, you can obtain the moment of inertia of this object rotating about a different axis by using the moment of inertia 
being rotated around its own center of mass and then adding, adding a term md squared, where d is the distance between the center of mass to the new axis. So d in this case would be, maybe if I draw it a different color, here's the center of mass. So d in this case would be half of the length of the, of the rod. So that's parallel axis theorem. So here's an example. We know that a rod, a solid rod being rotated about its halfway mark here, where we're telling you this from in the formula sheet or, or whatever, um, that, the cent that the moment of inertia of the rod being rotated around the center is one, one over 12 ml squared. Now, if we want, if we are now rotating the rod around this axis, how do we solve it? Well, it's gonna be the uh, parallel axis theorem. And we say, okay, it's gonna be the uh, moment of inertia of the center of mass, which is one over 12 ml squared, plus md squared. And you remember d was actually half the length. So simplifying this, we're gonna get one over four ml squared, and then one over 12 ml squared plus one over four ml squared is in fact one third ml squared. Now, here we see that the moment of inertia in scenario two is larger than the moment of inertia in scenario one. This means it's equivalent to saying something has more mass. If something has more mass, it's hard to move linearly. If something has a larger moment of inertia, it's harder for it to get to rotate. And this, this should be intuitive. This is easier to rotate than this. And if you don't believe me, try it yourself with something laying around your house. Okay, moving on. This means we now have to redefine what it means for an object to be in equilibrium. Previously, for an object to be in equilibrium, all we said was it had to be uh, f nat equals zero. That's what it used to mean to be in equilibrium. However, consider this thought experiment. If we take a force f and push straight upwards on the left-hand side, and if we take an, the same force f and we push downwards on the right-hand side, I think we can all agree that the net force on the object will equal zero, right? Force up, force down, they cancel out, the net force is zero. However, I think it's fairly easy to think about that if you were to push up on the left and down on the right, this beam would start to rotate. Well, if the beam used to be stationary and now it's rotating, I don't think it's really fair to say that that beam is in equilibrium, do you? I mean, equilibrium means there's nothing accelerating. Well, if it used to be stationary and now it's rotating, clearly there was some sort of acceleration present. So this means that there is, there is more to the story. So, if an object is truly, truly, truly in equilibrium, we now also have to say that the net torque is also equal to zero. Both of these things have to be true in order for an object to be classified as being in equilibrium, both F net equals zero and torque net equals zero. So that's what this slide here says. Both things have to be true for an object to be in equilibrium. Okay, um, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip that slide. Let's move on to an example, another example. Uh, for those of you who are from Canada and from Ontario, you will know the CN Tower, you may have even visited it. So let's do a question with the CN Tower. The CN Tower is known to have a height h. And for some strange reason, I don't know why, but let's pretend the CN Tower is being pushed at the very top 
a distance h by an unknown amount of force. Again, don't ask me how you're pushing the CN tower from the top. I don't know, maybe it's a blimp that's caught on, I don't know. Anyway, the center of mass of the CN tower, uh, uh, so, sorry, the center of mass of the CN tower M is obviously directly over the center of the circular base with the known radius of R. How much force will be needed to tip the CN tower over? So, new type of problem, torque problem, equilibrium torque problem. You've never seen this kind of problem before. How do we approach it? Spoiler, no different. Forces are involved, so let's draw a free body diagram. Now, because I've already established that with rotation, the shape of the object is important and the location of the forces are important, our free body diagram is no longer allowed to just be a simple dot. We actually have to capture the geometry of the problem now. But aside from that very minor difference, the analysis is virtually the same. So let's go ahead and draw this. So we have the center of mass of the CN tower right about there. And we're told in the problem that it's located directly dead center in the, in the base. So let's draw that force. Okay, force of gravity is acting down. We're also told that there's a force, an applied force, at the very top of the CN tower. I don't know how, but it is. We want to know how much force is required to tip over this object. So let's establish. If this object were to pivot, where would it pivot from? It would pivot from that point right there. I'm sure we can all uh, realize that if you were to take a cone object and push it from the top, it would pivot from the base on the bottom left. Now that we have this, we can uh, go to our torque equation torque net equals I alpha. And our goal is to just barely get this thing tip, tipped over. So um, our alpha is designed to be zero. We're not aiming for it to, to accelerate or, or rotationally accelerate. We just want to knock it over, uh, you know, knock it out of stability. That's what we want to do. So F, uh, uh, tau net is designed and targeted to be zero. Now, let's look here. Tau net, we have uh, our right hand rules to determine direction. So an applied force right there, uh, let's draw my lever arm. So I draw a straight line from the pivot point to the line of action of the force. So there it is there. And um, what kind of torque would this cause? Well, um, you would, uh, with your right hand, uh, point your fingernails in the direction of the force and then curl them in the direction of the rotation and your, your thumb points out of the page. So the torque due to this force is out of the page. And the torque due to the force of gravity, uh, I'll say here, out of page, and the torque due to the force of gravity uh, will be into the page. Your fingernails are pointing down, they curl uh, in the direction of the rotation that that force wants to cause, and uh, the force of gravity would want to cause rotation this way. So the torque due to the force of gravity would be into the page. So the torque net would be the torque due to the applied force minus the torque due to 
the force of gravity. They oppose each other. One wants to cause rotation clockwise, the other wants to cause rotation counterclockwise. So when you sum the torques, the, ve the vectors of the torques, you subtract them. And this, is to, this has to equal zero. What does torque equal? Torque equals force times the lever arm. So I'm just writing those in here. So it's a basic expansion. Okay, applied force. That's what we're solving for. Lever arm of the applied force. L sub FA, the lever arm of the applied force. Well, looking at my diagram, what's the lever arm of the applied force? What is the distance between the pivot point and the line of action of the applied force? Well, simply, that's just the height of the CN tower. So this is gonna be the applied force times the height of the CN tower. And the force of gravity is mg. Now what's the lever arm for the, for, uh, the force of gravity? Well, this is the whole point of having uh, a center of mass. I know that the mass is sort of distributed kind of everywhere, but the whole point of a center of mass is you can think of the force as, as acting on, uh, 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 you can think of, of the force of all of the particles being acted on at the center of mass. So the center of mass is right here. And if I were to draw the line of action, the black dotted line is the line of action of the force of gravity. And I were to, I have to connect the pivot point to the line of action such that they intersect at a 90 degree angle. You can see here from the diagram that that distance is simply the radius r. So here you can actually see that the, the force required to tip over the CN tower is mg times the radius over the height. And if you don't like my handwriting, I'll give you a moment to review um, this diagram here with uh, a, a better, a tight-setted version of the equations in case you don't like my handwriting. So I'll give you a moment to review that. In the meantime, I'm gonna just take a quick drink of water. Okay, so you see here how I'm extending the line of action and that the, the lever arm there is the radius. And here I'm connecting the pivot point to the force and that distance is the height. So that's where the lever arms come in. Okay, cranes. Cranes operate on the very, oop, what happened? Cranes operate on a similar principle. Um, you'll notice that this is exactly the image. Um, this is exactly the image for the course webpage on Canvas. This is actually a real image from the downtown campus um, on St. George Street across from the physics building, the McLennan Physical Labs. The engineering department built a new engineering building across from MP and across from Burton Tower. So this picture was taken a few years ago uh, of the construction of the engineering building. And that's when they had a crane, uh, you know, at the center of the building to help, to help make the building. And uh, MP being the physics building downtown, uh, Obviously, there's a bunch of physicists in the building, and uh, I walked into my office one day downtown, and uh, the person I shared my office with had this drawn on the window, which I absolutely just died laughing because it just sums us up so perfectly. And uh, you see here that cranes also obey the laws of torque because the whole point of a crane is that they are lifting a, a very, very, very heavy load uh, here at the end. Uh, and this load is able to be moved inwards or outwards. So you can see here in the picture, the load is kind of right here at the moment. And the pivot point, the pivot point would be here. So if, if a crane is actually picking up an object uh, to be transported up, you have a very, 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 very heavy object here. And um, the whole object would just, the whole crane would fall forward because of torque. 
So a crane actually needs to have a counter torque. A, a crane needs to have a sort of a weight at the opposite end. It's that way to balance out the torque. And operating a crane is quite tricky because the load that you're lifting actually has the ability to slide, maybe I'll draw it in green, has the ability to slide back and forth. And as you slide the load outward, um, you're changing how much torque that that load exerts on the crane. So as you slide the load outward, you actually also simultaneously have to move your counterweight to compensate. So um, it takes a lot of foresight and planning and thinking while operating a crane. Otherwise, it can be quite dangerous. So hopefully you can appreciate the course image now. It is a reflection of everything we've studied up until this point. F net equals MA, rotation, torque net equals I alpha, and all of that other fun stuff. Okay, I've got one more example to do here, and then we've got uh, something very quickly to, uh, we gotta move on to energy very quickly. So um, here's an, uh, an example of a crane. The question says, you know everything except tension one. Here's a crane attached to a table. We have the, the very heavy metal beam that consists of the crane. And it has to be a heavy metal beam because if it was a light metal beam, if it was a light metal beam, it would just crumble under the force. And this metal beam is uh, holding 400 newtons of, of load through this tension here. Um, however, the reason why this crane does not come crashing down is because there is a rope, maybe I'll draw this in a different color, there is a rope that is attached to the end of the crane, kind of like your muscle is attached to your forearm. There is a rope attached to the end of the crane anchored to the ground, or I guess in this case, the table. And it's the tension T1 that is providing the counter torque to the, to the, to the load, the torque due to the load. So the question is, what is the, the magnitude of the tension in the rope? in order for the crane to not come crashing down. So again, we draw a free body diagram. Here's my pivot point. And what forces are going on here? Well, I have tension one kind of acting backwards. I have tension two acting straight down. And the other thing I have is the weight of the crane itself. So the center of mass of the crane is obviously, oops, smack in the middle of this, of this rod. It's pretty easy to figure out that the center of mass of a uniform rod is in the middle. So we actually also have a force of gravity in the middle. And the whole, the, the whole point of this question is that we want the crane to function properly, so we want the net torque to equal zero. If the net torque was not equal to zero, then that means there would be an, uh, a rotational acceleration, which is bad. You do not want a crane to be rotating uh, at all. So let's do this. We're gonna have the torque due to tension one. The torque due to tension one is gonna be counterclockwise. And that is in the opposite direction to the torque due to tension two. And torque one is also opposite uh, to the force of gravity. So um, force of gravity and tension two are in the clockwise direction and torque one is in the counterclockwise direction. So that's how I got my appropriate plus and minus signs. And the sum of them have to equal zero. And torque is equal to force times the lever arm. So let's do that now. So we have the force, oops, the torque due to tension one is gonna be tension one times the lever arm for tension one. And I can bring everything to the other side. This is gonna be um, tension two times the lever arm for uh, tension two. And this is gonna be the force of gravity of the rod times the lever arm 
of the force of gravity located at the center of mass. So this point should be free marks for every student in the class. Free body diagrams are nothing new. F net equals MA is nothing new. So torque net equals I alpha shouldn't be that new. And uh, listing the forces in the free body diagram uh, just as a starting equation is also not difficult. So this should be, up until now, should be free marks for everyone. Calculating what the lever arms are, however, is where the difficult part comes in. So let's do that now using some geometry. Extend the line of action for the force of gravity. Extend the line of action for tension two. We now have to connect the pivot point to the line of action for the force of gravity. This is the lever arm for the force of gravity. We do the same for the tension two. That's the lever arm for tension two. Now, looking at geometry, this is fairly easy. This is gonna be tension two times, now we, we are given that angle, aren't we? It's uh, 53 degrees. So this is gonna be, um, let's see here, the length of the rod, which I don't know, the length of the rod times uh, let's see here, cos 53. Plus mg of the rod times half of the length of the rod times cos 53. So those are the lever arms of those two forces. Now, what's the lever arm of tension T1? dot, 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 extend the line of action, connect the pivot point to the line of action such that they intersect at a 90 degree angle, and there is your triangle. We know this angle is 37 degrees, so we actually know this angle in here will be 16 degrees. So just to recap, that triangle 53 degrees, 37 degrees. This angle we can solve. It's going to be 180 minus 53. Oh boy, 180 minus 53. So this angle in here is 16. So we know this angle in here is 16 degrees. So we have this triangle now whose hypotenuse is L. This is 16 degrees, and this is the lever arm that we want. So that means the lever arm for T1 is actually gonna be L times sine of 16. And all the L's cancel, and we're left with T1 sine of 16 equals T2 actually, T2 plus MGL, nope, MG over 2 times cos 53. And therefore, tension 1 is equal to, oh, what's tension 2? 4,000? 4,000 plus MG over 2 cos 53 all over sine of 16. So there you go. Um, I will mention that the solution of this is in the typed notes. So I know we went a little bit fast, but please I encourage you to review the typed notes. Um, that's pretty much all there is to torque, to be completely honest with you. Um, all I can say at this point is do practice. Um, I will draw your attention to, uh, we didn't have time to do it in lecture, but you know all the material. Technically, there's nothing new about this. But so please practice, 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 practice. 
Um, specifically, maybe look at pulleys that have mass. Your book does a really good job at showing you an example of a pulley that is not massless. Up until now, we've assumed that pulleys are massless. And uh, when a pulley is not massless, then part of the force from the, the, the rope has to go into a, uh, accelerating the mass of the pulley uh, as, as it rotates. Um, so that, that has to be considered as well. And um, this you can use with tau net equals I alpha. So I would encourage you to go back. Please look at the textbook for um, pulley questions where there is, where there is um, uh, pulleys that do have a little bit of mass. Okay. The last topic we have is rotational energy. Um, maybe I'm going to stop the recording to split the video up into two because it is technically a different topic. So um, I'll see you in the next video. But if you're live with me, please, please hang tight.